Hello everybody and welcome back to ESA Summer 21. If you didn't know already, we are raising money for Save the Children. If you want to donate, you can find the link below the stream or in the chat by, point, by writing exclamation point donate. Also want to give a very quick shout out to our sponsors Twitch and ViewSonic for sponsoring this event. And uh, friends, it is time for some Pikmin action right now. Pikmin 2 to be exact by Jack Drass. So uh, good luck and have fun on the run. Brill, yeah, thank you. Um, I'll give a countdown now. I think I'll explain the game's premise while we're watching these sort of intro cutscenes. So um, three, two, one, start. Alrighty, so um, I guess as a quick thing as well, I'm joined by two illustrious guests from the European Pikmin community. So we first have Kemi, so feel free to say hi. Hey everyone, uh, I run this game. Uh, hello. <laughs> and then we have Max25, the other English brother joining me for this. <laughs> hey everyone, I've been I've been running this game for about three years now. It's, uh, it's nice to be here today. Indeed. So, for those of you that don't really know about Pikmin, it's sort of Nintendo's quirky cousin game, <laughs> is how I always think about it. So it's an action RTS, where you have one little unit that you use all the time called Pikmin, who are these guys. So the goal is to sort of get an army of them as big as possible and pay off the company's debt. Because the, the character we're playing as, Olimar, works for a freight company called Hoko Tape Freight and they have somehow gotten themselves into a lot of debt. So what we're doing now is to try and <laughs> pay off that debt by coming back to the planet that Olimar crashed on, where they found treasures last time that suddenly ended up being worth a lot of money. So we've come back to get more things like that. So um, anyway, the first trick that we started there, as you could probably guess, that didn't look very normal, right? Why did walk up to a wall and throw a Pikmin into it? That's called Day One Extinction. You throw a Pikmin outside of the boundary of the game and you run it off the level and kill him. So what it does is it forces the game to end the day early. And that means that you skip, I think, about six and a half minutes of tutorial. Of course, in that tutorial, you grow more Pikmin. So you have to sort of grow those Pikmin still, which we're going to do here. But um, yeah, in one of the other categories, we would do that. But here, not the case. So as you can see, our first Pikmin is now this person who's in the ground as opposed to those five that were harassing that enemy called a Bulb Bulb over there. Ah, so we start from one, work our way up to a much bigger number. Okay, so these pellets are how we're gonna grow that. This is what this cutscene explains. Thankfully the game, most for the most part, you can skip the cutscenes, but there are a small handful. <laughs> that you sort of have to painfully watch. Such as this one. So if you can read the text, you'll get a sense of what's going on. Good luck doing that though. <laughs> okay. So, but it's not just those pellets that can be food for growing more Pikmin. So this enemy over here, we are luring him back to the onion which you've just seen create food. And we're gonna do following. Okay. So that's the cutscene that... So we're getting sort of weird cutscenes playing throughout this process that would normally play during the tutorial. But <laughs> we uh, have to play them at sort of weird points during this growth phase. God, it feels like we're going a mile a minute here. I don't really think about early game that much anymore. But um, that trick I just did there was called um, Louis Skip. So one of the other unskippable cutscenes is where Louis basically finds the onion and goes, what is this? And then a Pikmin sprout comes out of it. But you can end the day at the same time the cutscene would trigger and you skip it. So that's about 20 seconds of time save that we got there. And it's a one frame input. Oh, different runners have different feelings on it, but I think everyone here today does Louis skip. I'm not really sure. <laughs> yeah, I definitely go for it in attempts. Yeah. yeah, I definitely go for it now too. Yeah, but it is one of those things where in sort of PB attempts, if you miss it, you're pretty much dead. Because <laughs> sure, yeah. the name of the game of this, which we'll get into more later on, but it's all about multitasking. So much like real-time strategy games elsewhere, it's really about making sure that your Pikmin are all doing something useful at the same time. So these splits so far haven't really been able to show that very well, but 
yeah, the split that we're going into now, maybe I can focus up for a bit and one of the commentators can explain sort of what the objective is. That'd be helpful. Yeah, so landing in day four, um, basically our goal is just to grow the rest of, or most of the rest of the red Pikmin that we're going to need in the run, and also to crush a bag that's in our way and break down a wall that's in our way, and then we'll enter the first cave in the run. Yes. Um, so yeah, basically Jack is just going to be running around, getting a lot of stuff in sort of an optimal path here, um, and doing a lot of plucking. There's another trick coming up in a minute called Egg Push. I'm sure you'll know it when you see it. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's nice and self-explanatory. I like that trick, actually. <laughs> There's yeah. really not much nuance to the name. <laughs> it's a really, it's a real highlight of um, of trick naming. It's egg push, but well, what do you do? You push an egg. Yeah, I remember the American scene tried to call it the DoorDash strategy for a while because you sort of deliver <laughs> an egg, but that was very quickly vetoed by everyone else who correctly pointed out that that's stupid. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, that'll be coming up here. And as Kemi's pointed out, you can see that I'm sort of doing things in a very specific order. So like growing all the bits in the spawn area there. Oh God, sorry, I lost count there. Um, <laughs> growing all the bits in the spawn area there was in a very specific order. So the first pellet there, you have to be able to get 15 to crush those paper bags. So we only started today with 13. So we had to get the quickest two Pikmin earlier in the day. So that was why we did that pellet first, but then we still have to do all the other pellets at the same time. So it's about, you know, scheduling, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, that was egg push. No, there it is. Um, yeah, that's actually easier than it looks. Um, like a lot of new runners are intimidated by that, but it's genuinely not that bad. Yeah. Um, just with like a tiny bit of practice. Um, but it does save a decent amount of time. Actually, it saves like upwards of ten seconds, I think. It's yeah, I think it, it can be like a lot of time if you like really nail it, because you can play the rest of the day differently, like ever so slightly differently. Oh god, this is a. So these are my tights. <laughs> I ideally need to kill a handful of these two. Okay, that'll be difficult. Yeah, so getting metites here, normally eggs in this game, um, you get nectar out of them most of the time, which is what Jack just got, um, and it makes your Pikmin into flowers. Uh, flower Pikmin move faster, they carry things faster, you want all your Pikmin to be flowers at all times, basically. Um, however, eggs have, I think, is it a 5% chance to spawn metites? Yeah, I think it's about that. Yeah, Matites or Mytites, uh, people pronounce yeah. them differently. <laughs> um, yeah, that makes the split a little bit awkward. Um, in theory, getting Matites on this split does save time because you can use their bodies to grow a bunch of extra Pikmin. Um, yep. But it's kind of difficult. You need to, uh, they, they sort of scare all your Pikmin around and you have to whistle them back and throw them quite quickly right on top of the Matites in order to kill them. Yeah. So. So for it's context, awkward, we've gone completely off the grid here. So the four, we grew four Pikmin from the Matites, which are these people that are under the ground here. But as a result, we didn't have to gather that Bulbul -bul body that you can probably see in the horizon over there. So that's a bit of sort of on the fly rooting, I guess. It'll have some benefits because we'll have more Pikmin on the gate earlier than we would normally. Because normally we'd have to put four sort of Pikmin on this body to carry that back. But now those four Pikmin are instead on the gate. So I have no idea how this is going to look. I'll be completely honest. This is the perfect example of doing it live, but I can't, I can't imagine it'll be too bad. <laughs> it felt fast, yeah. if nothing else. So Jack ended up with 52 total Pikmin here. That's actually exactly the same as the normal amount you get. Um, there is um, like a kind of an alternate thing you can do where if you get more than 52 Pikmin, like if you get 56 total or something like that, um, there's a gate in the next area, like right at the beginning, and that ends up saving a ton of time for that gate if you can get 56, 58 Pikmin there. Um, nobody really grinds for that in runs, but it is technically a bit faster. Yeah, I think it will be the most soul-destroying grind of all time. Here, do this, <laughs> six, do this six, like, six minute segment as many times as possible until you go <laughs> insane for a, a one in 20 chance thing to save not even that much time. So yeah. this is the first technically randomly generated layout in the game. So um, the way the game generates these, that we will call them sub-level floors, is it has a set bunch of rules. So it basically has a bunch of rooms that it'll put and a bunch of corridors that will connect the rooms in a certain order. So we'll spare you the details because even I don't know and I'm supposedly the world record holder for this game <laughs> fully how the generation algorithm works. But essentially know that 
I have a sense of how a floor is going to look whenever I land in it based on how the floors will generate. Yeah. And I think Kemi is actually probably the sage, <laughs> the most sage person in this call about it. So if there are any sort of neat details that anyone wants to point out, then absolutely go for it. Yeah, as we get like later into the run, I'll try to explain some of the like heuristics that we use as runners to to sort of figure out what the layout's going to be ahead of time. Um, but really, like in in these early caves, they basically generate not not strictly always the same. Like the enemy placements are going to be different every time. But this sub level, for example, has exactly this layout every time. These purple flowers are always going to be here. Speaking of which, we get Indeed. our second type of Pikmin now. Indeed. I feel like something I also didn't clarify on the first floor, sorry. It's, uh, I sometimes forget how fundamental a lot of the stuff we're working with is here. The two items that I picked up on the last floor are those treasures that I referred to. So of course, the treasures are where basically most of the money is. And the goal is to get 10,000 of the in-game's currency called Pocos. So we're really going to be focusing on getting those treasures back to the pod as quickly as possible. That's sort of the the basic aim. <laughs> Everything we're doing is just to achieve that goal. And these are the purple Pikmin. I'm sure if anyone who's played this game will remember them very fondly. Their base character trait is they're very slow, but they are very, very strong. We always joke about the fact that purple Pikmin are literally so broken the game doesn't even know how to handle them sometimes. And I'm sure we'll have a good few examples of that sort of later on. But you can see here, they're designed to like squish these bulb orbs here in a much more efficient fashion than like red Pikmin are. So they sort of home in and then just crush them. <laughs> yeah, so in total, purple Pikmin, they weigh 10 units, where normal Pikmin weigh one. They carry 10 units, where normal Pikmin carry one. Um, they have that sort of homing pound attack when you throw them as opposed to a normal arc which makes them really, really good for killing small bulb orbs. That homing pound attack also has a chance to stun most enemies. So um, especially on some of the bigger bulb orbs we'll see, um, you can kill them basically hands-free. Like if you throw three purples and then one of them happens to stun, you can sort of just walk away and the bulb orb will die from the three purples. Yeah, I think the stun mechanic is probably one of the most broken parts about the Pikmin, <laughs> to be honest. Because oh, the stun, sure. like you'll see it later on, it lasts for a very long time. Alrighty. So also, if both of you can remind me to save in points where I wouldn't normally save, that would be greatly appreciated. So here is yep. an example. So yep. the saving, it's like not a huge deal for, obviously we're in a marathon, so we have to acknowledge the reality of that. But normally wouldn't save, because I think each save is about one second, two second in screens like that, or just a little bit of time loss elsewhere. For simplification's sake, I guess. Yeah, normally in PB attempts you wouldn't use a mem card, it, it loses a significant amount of time. Yeah, so this is probably the only save I won't do, because there's not really much point. <laughs> so yeah, that's the first area cleared. So you saw that treasure we gathered there in the what's called Emergence Cave was um, a globe. So I shouted out to Europe on the globe, but the whole point of it is it's a key item, if you want to think about it that way, it unlocks a new area. So that's where we are now, so this is Awakening Wood. This is sort of the second, I'd say the first, like, substantial area that we're going to be in for a long time. The first of probably three. Yeah, probably about a third of the run is going to be spent in this area, if not longer. Yeah. So the purpose of this segment that we're going through here, again, is sort of similar to when we were entering the Emergence Cave earlier. It's about growing Pikmin, but also this gate here, it sort of blocks off all progress in terms of getting to those caves. And of course the caves, as a rule of thumb, are where the items with the most like monetary value are located. So getting to those caves sort of as soon as possible is really the, <laughs> the goal. Yeah, there are treasures above ground. Uh, you might be able to spot them if you have keen eyes, um, but we're not really going to spend any time just getting those treasures. Um, throughout the run, we'll get above ground treasures when we have to wait on something else usually. So like if there's like, uh, for example, there's going to be a split later in the same area where we have to carry another one of those key item treasures uh, to unlock mm -hmm. the next area. And while that's carrying, we're going to do a route where we can grow a whole bunch of other Pikmin as well as get most of the rest of the above ground treasures at the same time. So basically you can think of it like getting them for free because we're sort of bottlenecked by one thing happening. Um, 
And then the rest of the time that we're waiting for that, we can do whatever we want. Exactly. It's the key result of that, like multitasking, that is sort of the, <laughs> the key word for this entire speed game. So, because you get money, but then also you need Pikmin to be able to access those caves with more, yeah, more value. So we do them at the same time, as Kemi said. Alrighty. So this is a Honey Wisp. We're doing this to uh, flower the rest of our Pikmin, but you can see there's quite a lot of um, leaf Pikmin on the gate. So again, <laughs> it's another mechanic that I sort of brief briefly skipped over in the beginning stages. But flower Pikmin, they're the same as regular Pikmin, but their movement speed is increased. That's the only change. So for anyone who played this game when you were a kid, no, their attack power does not increase. <laughs> I thought it too when I joined the speedrunning scene, but alas. But no, it helps them. Um, they move with the captains faster and they also carry treasures a lot faster. So, you know, given we're at speedrun <laughs> marathon, you can guess that's probably quite useful. Alrighty, so this is our first cave in Awakening Wood. This is Hole of Beasts. This is the first cave that the game really lets you go in, in a sort of conventional sense. So um, this cave is really important for quite a few reasons, but also the treasures that are in this cave have a high, really high value in general. So it's super worth going to. Yeah, a lot of the early areas and caves in this game, like all the treasures in the early areas are worth a ton of Pocos. Whereas like later on into the game, we're going to be getting treasures that are worth like, you know, 60. There's even one that's worth 35 Pocos like near the end. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, the game sort of gets stingy as it goes on. <laughs> I was literally about to say that exact word. Yeah, the game's like, okay, we've given you, we've given you some money. Now you've got to start earning it. I think. <laughs> yeah. Whereas most of these treasures here are going to be worth like a hundred. Uh, some of them two hundred. I think. Yeah. There's one that's like two hundred and sixty sometime soon. Like, uh, they're really, really. Expensive. Yeah, I think it. I think it's two hundred and eighty actually. That's probably idiot. one of the most expensive treasures we get in the entire run. But it's like basically given to you on a silver platter in this cave, so yeah. super nice. And again, we're not running into much of the variations in the sub-levels yet. That's sort of a... Well, I think Hole of Beast 4, when we get to that, will probably be the first like key sub-level that actually does have some meaningful variation to it. <laughs> yeah. On this sub-level, for example, the only like serious variation is where the placement of the exit hole is. Um, so there's like a hole that's randomly placed um, in every sublevel to go to the next sublevel, and basically it can be in any of these alcoves. Sometimes it's like in the middle of the room, um, and sometimes it's like in the same room that you spawn in in one of the alcoves, which is the worst possible case because you yeah. have to run all the way back. But uh, again, it's sort of a, you can see it when you come down into the sublevel because again, those of you with keen eyes have probably spotted that the game gives you a little bit of a sneak preview of what you're going to be working with once you come down into a sub-level. And that's something that, from the speedrun perspective, is really important to look at. Yeah, that's how we get like most of our info about sub-levels, uh, especially later into the game, because you get that like one sneak peek of a bird's eye view, and if you have good knowledge of how the, the sub-levels generate, you can basically read the whole floor like straight off in yeah. some cases. Yeah, yeah. You have to forgive me all sorry behind the scenes of shutting the blind because the sun is, <laughs> as people can probably see, hitting me straight in the face. But uh, never mind. Okay, so again, in the continuing theme of incredibly high value treasures, is a Mahjong piece worth 150. And then this, I, I'm not even sure if this is real. Does anyone in the, the chat know if this is real? Or like anyone in the call, I guess. <laughs> Nintendo floppy disks. I'm not sure if that actually exists. I think Brilliant. it is, but I don't remember what game that is. It would make sense, because Nintendo used to make, like, what, physical games, didn't they? I, I think, think so, yeah. So I could see the transition. <laughs> could see how that would make sense. Okay. So this is Holy Piece 4. This is the first floor where the layout difference is, like, actually really significant. Um, there's sort of one side room that generates on this floor. Oh, it looks like this is a really good layout. It is. Um, <laughs> there's sort of one side room on this floor that, that we're looking for on the come down. Um, which is where, in almost every layout, that card treasure will spawn. Uh, this time it spawned in an alcove, which is quite rare uh, and very, very fast. This is like close to best possible Hollow East 4, actually. Yes. So that explains partially why the difference between the estimate and any of you who may have looked at the speedrun.com world record, for instance, the time disparity between that, even though it's me who did both the runs, is quite high. Because. <laughs> Part of it is sort of RNG reliant. Okay, so 
up here, I think is probably one of the audio, the only audio cues I've got for the entire run. So I'll, uh, I'll just take a second, try and get that. Ooh, this might be tight, but we'll see. Hmm. Okay, maybe. So this is Empress Bulblax. And there nice. goes Empress Bulblax. So, um, basically, if you swarm a large amount of Pikmin into her, the sort of correct timing, she goes into a sort of stun animation instead of reacting and shaking them off, which is what she would normally do. So it's sort of... It looks, like, very fast and sort of random there, but... I think uh, Cap, who's another very notable runner in this game, found out that if you just run straight at Empress literally as fast as the game gives you control of your whistle, then the, it sort of lines up with that timing. So uh, you can actually one-cycle her, which is insane. <laughs> yeah, there is a slightly slower setup that most runners do, which is where you sort of go around to the side of her and then wait for sort of a later cycle. The audio cue you're listening for is her breathing because it, it lines up with her animation. Um, yep. So most runners will go around and like wait one cycle to get just the right timing, uh, which is a lot more reliable if you haven't practiced the the fastest version. But you know, Jack is the world record holder for a reason. <laughs> I sometimes forget. <laughs> I must admit, <laughs> this game is. Hopefully, we don't have to run into that today. But this game is incredible at making you think, even though you've played it for two or three years, like you're an actual idiot. Like because <laughs> you're trying to control a hundred basically petulant school children to get them to do what you want them to do at the same time uh, sometimes with success and sometimes without so uh, yeah you get humbled by the game very often I'll put it that way <laughs> I think everyone everyone here has probably had some sort of experience where they just felt like actually incredibly stupid <laughs> alrighty so next cave in Awakening Wood White Flower Garden. It's a lot quicker to get to because we've already taken down that big gate and we got the purples to knock down that bag because their increased weight is really important for being heavy enough to sort of push it down. You could see that you needed um, 200 Pikmin, which is impossible as the game limits you to 100 in the field at one time. So uh, purples are essential there and you don't get enough <clears throat> early on. <laughs> okay. Yeah, in, in certain other categories, you would actually re-enter Emergence Cave um, like a second time to get uh, more purples initially, and then you would do White Flower Garden first. Um, yes. Like in All Treasures, uh, the, the different category. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, in Payoff Debt, like, we don't need that many purples, and there's a really convenient place to grow 10 more in Holo Beasts, so, so we don't bother to do that first. Yeah, exactly. Like the sort of main route for it. <laughs> the main route for it just goes Holo Beasts first and White Flower Garden. It's yeah. interesting, this game has sort of like two levels of routing. So it has obviously I would what I would describe as the more conventional speedrun sense of routing. Where like you take your game as a big problem and then you work it out. And you say like going here and doing this earlier is better and doing things in a certain order, right? Like every game has that. But Pikmin 2 is very, very, very unique in the the entire of the game. So sort of like how I played this sub-level, for instance, I've sort of routed this. So I'll go to the furthest away treasures first because they'll take the longest to come back. It's sort of like for the, anyone who's a, like knowledgeable about it, it's called the traveling man problem. It's sort of like an incredibly kid-friendly version of that with enemies. <laughs> but yeah, and then when the sub-levels get increasingly more complicated throughout the run, the sort of complexity of routing also increases. Oh yeah, so. like... In, in races that we've done, like set seed races, we've had hours long conversations about single sublevels. Yeah. Like one particular layout of one particular sublevel. Like it gets <laughs> insanely deep if you want to like really optimize it. Yeah, and then doing, yeah. it, doing that on the fly is where a lot of the fun of this run comes from. I think it's just amazingly deep in terms of like how high the skill ceiling is for running this game. Yeah, I think Cap once referred to it as opening your third eye in Pikmin 2. <laughs> Once you finally start routing like the actual generated sub-levels like really, really, really quickly and without thinking about it, but it works well. And you're like, wait, what? <laughs> I had to think about this like a couple months ago. Why is this so effortless now? So uh, yeah, I'm sure every runner will have some sort of experience with that. Alrighty, so this is the third type of Pikmin we're going to be getting for the run. These are white Pikmin. I guess, uh, Kemi, do you want to explain, as you did so eloquently last time, what their sort of <laughs> benefits are? Sure. Yeah, so White Pikmin, these 
So we said purple Pikmin are like the most important for the speedrun. White Pikmin are a strong contender for that because white Pikmin, their main sort of ability, besides uh, being able to dig up buried treasures like you're seeing right now, is that they are very, very fast. Um, so to talk quickly about Pikmin speeds, um, flowered reds have like an internal speed value of two. Um, flowered purples have a speed value of 1.8, so they're slightly slower. Flowered white Pikmin have a speed value of four. So they are literally twice as fast as other Pikmin types. And th this is for carrying things, by the way, not walking. Yes. So they are just like a, a massive help. Like you'll see um, for some small treasures, actually on the next floor, um, if you can completely load them up with whites, they will just zoom through the floor and they'll make a lot of a lot of sub levels like way more bearable. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, you'll often see, I think maybe not, well, I guess you saw it on this floor actually. It's actually worth the time to reload a treasure. So stop it moving temporarily to then put white on it instead of like red Pikmin just because as we sort of explained they go literally double the speed so <laughs> even if it takes a second if the whole travel time is like 20 seconds then you save a lot of time so this is one of the stinky flaws that we don't like in the game that can give you bad rng so as you can see we spawned in this room i have to walk all the way through here all the way through to this far room and then this treasure here is the only one we're getting in this floor so you can see it's all the way on the other side of the room and here uh, yeah, here we're just waiting. So honestly, uh, if the host has any sort of thing they want to shout out, now would be a really good time. Awesome, great. Yeah, we got a donation here. We got $15 from Bess, and th hopefully this makes sense to you. And if not, well, here we go. It says, let's go, NE. Good luck, yep. have fun, Dr. Arizona. <laughs> Thanks, Bess. Long time no see. I hope you're doing well. I also quickly want to mention, by the way, that we are on that we, that we are about one thousand and two hundred dollars away from reaching our total that we managed to get at ESA twenty fourteen. And um, we're tracking all of our milestones here. It's uh, we have ESA had thirteen marathons in the past, and so far we surpassed seven of those. And uh, this next one would be the eighth. So, yeah. And also remember, all of this is going to go towards a good cause. 100% of all of your donation go directly towards Save the Children. So uh, yeah, please get those donations in. Back to the run. Brill, thanks for that. Um, so nothing really important happened here. It may look important, but it's really not. That enemy is called a Snagret. So it's a mix between, I don't know, a snake and some other bird. <laughs> I must admit, I'm uncultured, so I don't know which bird. But um, yeah, I think that's probably the first exhibition of the power of purples. We really just kind of destroyed him. <laughs> he didn't even get a chance to really do anything and we just pounded him with purple Pikmin. So, because when they come down with a pound, that itself does damage, but the purples themselves, every time they hit an enemy, also does damage. So it stacks up really fast. Yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna use slash abuse purples to kill, to quick kill, I'm pretty sure every boss in the category. Yep, so we'll yep. see several more <laughs> and basically none of them get a chance to do anything to us because they just instantly die to purples. Yeah, exactly. So here, here it is. This is probably the most important trick. I have to remember to save here. Yeah, save. So this is the key sort of sequence break, <laughs> if you will. So there's a type of Pikmin that we haven't got yet that I'll, I'll spoil. They're blue. And their gimmick is they can go underwater. So of course, you're not meant to be able to get these until you've been to a much later area, but we're going to go and get them now. So <laughs> as you can see, that opens up a lot of... um opportunities for going into different areas earlier so uh, yeah i guess i will execute that trick first it's like a, a 30 second setup so <laughs> yeah, so the way the way this trick is going to go i'll let jack focus here the way this trick is going to go is he's going to abuse the knapsack that we just got that was that glove treasure from the snack rit. that lets you lay down and be carried by your pikmin and if you lay down in certain spots you can sort of trick the game's pathing into carrying you up ledges um that's what he did there here he's using a cutscene and a scale to clip out of bounds. Um, just the scale keeps moving during the cutscene. And then what he's going to be doing right here is walking along a, a very small out of bounds ledge, doing a precise lineup like this, and then running off the ledge and knapsacking at a, uh, a specific spot. What that does mm. is when you've napped, oh. I have, I have soft locked. <laughs> so that is a very annoying quirk of the trick. 
yeah. <laughs> where so... sort of randomly out of my control, the captain becomes a treasure outside of the boundary. But then sometimes he's sort of in this weird in-between state. I'll try and explain it that way, where it will just kill the captain because the game sort of coded to kill the treasure, I guess, and then spawn it back in, which is why I ended up in the Blue Onion area. But <laughs> if it kills the captain, then it actually just kills the captain and you can't use him and it soft locks. So yeah. that's why we are here. So what's meant to happen is that um, you sort of use the knapsack, the game considers you a treasure, and then you hit like a fail safe out of bounds, where if a treasure falls off, it will teleport it to like a nearby location within bounds. And normally it's supposed to teleport you to the blue onion like you saw, but then you're supposed to be able to get up. But if you sort of, uh, like if, if your captain, like the player captain, not the treasure captain, sort of hits a kill plane that's sort of at the same height, uh, in you know with inconvenient timing, then you soft lock like that. Yeah, not a huge deal since we saved right before it. We can just retry, mm -hmm. uh, but that is really unfortunate. Yeah, so it's one of those ones that in regular runs would be sort of obviously run killing because this is like probably a minute of time. But there you go. So that's how it's that's how it's meant to look. Now I've got my little red light. I'm back in the onion area. Can happen. <laughs> the community's uh, in talks about it as well because there's discussion of a patch that can sort of get rid of it which we're uh, wondering whether to use. But for now, as <laughs> as the game intended, I soft lock and I'm back. But it's fine. So now we have blue Pikmin, which is honestly incredible. So now we can go back to the starting area, which you couldn't see from my time there, but um, has a lot of it cordoned off by water. So of course we can then grow some blues and use them to really mix up the timings of things. <laughs> which has a bunch of benefits, honestly. You get a lot of the money earlier, you get a really high amount of Pikmin just like early on conveniently while you're getting another treasure here. There's just a lot of benefits to it. <laughs> so I'll, I'll leave it at that. But I, we estimate it takes probably about six minutes. So that's sort of what you need to know. <laughs> so here, as you can see, we normally we'd have to destroy that gate, but we sort of you know, snuck under the entire level geometry and found our way in. <laughs> yeah. If you're curious, by the way, whether you could go like up on top of the Out of Bounds Collision and walk in, you actually cannot. There are invisible walls uh, above the level all around that place. So you can actually get up onto those walls out of bounds there, but you couldn't just walk into the Blue Onion area because of the invisible walls. Yeah. So credit to the game devs. They actually knew that it would be sort of in our interest to get to the Blue Onion area early. But uh, they couldn't stop us. Olimar is the greatest bank heist operator of all time. <laughs> we have done it. All it took was literally passing through the floor somehow. All right, so Snagger Hall. This is the most RNG variant cave in the game. So there'll be, <laughs> if anybody decides to run this game, you will hear a lot of whinging about this cave, but it is actually very cool. We're basically in a birdhouse, which is what the first floor here is. And we sort of make our way down into it. So Snagger, it's those enemies we killed before in White Flower Garden are sort of the theme enemy for the cave, if you want to think about it that way. So I'll be seeing lots of them. But yeah, has a lot of um, very valuable treasures in here as well. I think there's about a thousand Pocos, maybe, and change in here in total. So super worth our time going to. So yeah, there, it's... that was, oh, sorry, I was just going to say, that was probably the first example of like a standard enemy getting absolutely melted by purple Pikmin. So that was an orange ball ball. Normally a really big threat. They can spot you from miles away, but we actually lowered him down the cliff and then just destroyed him. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this is SH2. This floor is universally loathed by runners because it's probably like one of the single most frustrating floors in terms of generation. There actually aren't that many floors that will just sort of like lose you time objectively based on a generation, but this is one of the ones that can. Um, so we don't like it very much. But thankfully, uh, this one seems to be, you know, somewhat okay. <laughs> yeah, it's I all think right. as well, as as with anything in sort of RNG elements in speedrunning, uh, it's <laughs> it gets to the point that the higher the quality of the run overall, the higher your standards sort of have to be for sections like this. So I would describe this floor as like very good, but obviously you can get ones where the strawberry will spawn within spitting distance, really. <laughs> so, um, yeah, there's various uh, nuance there. So I'm going back to the spawn area now, and this is to grow more uh, white Pikmin. 
because you can only get whites and purples in caves. I guess that's sort of how the game thought it would be good to balance them out. You can't just grow as many as you like, otherwise this will be a very different speed game. But um, it means that we're trying to multitask that as much as possible. So obviously we need these white Pikmin, but getting the strawberry is still by far the most important thing we're doing. It's the whole objective of why we're all here today, <laughs> is to get 10,000 Pokos. So get those whites and try not lose too much time. But because whites have so much carry speed, even if we do lose some time, as you'll see here, because we've got the uh, Sun Seed Berry. I think it's Sun Seed Berry. Ah, oh, Combustion Berry. I tried. There's lots of strawberries. Um, so <laughs> even though we were spending time here plucking and not going down further into the cave to get to more of those high value treasures that we're talking about, the white Pikmin's increased carry speed just makes every single treasure you collect for the rest of the entire run, like, way quicker. And oh, just Jack, did... we didn't talk about bug buddies at all. <gasps> oh, very, very, very good point. Yes, Kemi, please. Please yeah, debrief the people. So <laughs> I think we forgot you... this last time, too. <laughs> <Sorry>. yeah. <laughs> so we, you may have noticed that in caves, we're sort of carrying the, the bodies of creatures we've killed uh, back to the ship, as well as treasures. Um, above ground, when you do that, you grow more Pikmin with them because you bring them to the onion. Um, like, the head of that snag right there is, is a bug body. Um, in caves, however, because you have no onion, you just bring them to the ship, and they're worth like a small amount of pokos each. So most treasures are worth on the order of 100-ish, uh, whereas most bug bodies are worth between 2 and 10 yeah. pokos. So it doesn't sound like a lot, but by the end of the run, we're aiming to get like, what is it, like 250 pokos worth of yeah, bug bodies? Yeah, somewhere between 250 and 280, I think is the number that's in my head. <laughs> so like it, that, yeah. it seems like each individual bug body you get won't be a huge deal but like across the course of the run they're absolutely pivotal and it's something we'll be thinking about a lot yeah like you have to kill a lot of enemies just as sort of a natural course of running through the sub levels and so if you can just like put one purple pikmin on them when you kill them get their bodies carrying back it really adds up over over the course of the run and ideally you can get those bodies without losing any time so that's just like a couple hundred Pokos worth of treasures that we don't have to worry about. Or don't have to worry about getting treasures for at least. Yeah, exactly. Because getting all the treasures takes time, right? So the whole purpose is that we're trying to get really high value items as quickly as possible. But but even though the bugs aren't high value, they cost no time. So that's sort of the trade-off in theory, right? Like we've gotten the magnet as fast as we can, essentially. But now we're also going to try and get these bugs and they're basically free. So they're like an extra 10%. I think that, that may have been what you were saying. <laughs> I, was, I was a bit stressed about the kind of beetle. Sorry if that was <laughs> exactly what you said. But yeah. Speaking of high value treasures, um, you may notice that there's like a cherry over there on the side. That's another <laughs> treasure. <laughs> Max, Special maybe you should tell us about the cherry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the, the cherry is only worth 20 pokus. However, if it can be collected fast, it, the only time you would ever collect this cherry is if it loses zero time to collect the cherry. Mm -hmm. And apparently I'm known for collecting cherry a lot, more than others. <laughs> yeah, different runners have very different styles of things they like collecting. So the reason that cherry, like we say it has to take no time to actually grab it, is because it, it's only worth 20, which I think we said before, but the cutscenes themselves are actually time that you're spending. So like every time you get a treasure, it sort of plays this little jingle and does a cutscene and gives you its very funny, quirky name. But um, that actually costs time, we actually don't like that. So like. Unless the treasure's worth that sort of cutscene time, we're sometimes pretty stingy on activating it. So the cherry's a really good example of that. There are treasures which are really low value that we just don't ever get in runs for that exact reason. Yeah, because like even even if you could collect it without wasting any time like carrying it, the treasure cutscene is still like nine or ten seconds and that would make it just not worth it. We kind of go by like a pokos per second rule where any anything you can get that's pokus per second above 2.0 ish is likely to be worth it yeah. um and so like you know if we're talking 10 seconds for a treasure cutscene assuming no time loss carrying something then anything that's worth 20 pokos or less is sort of a fringe and there yeah. are a decent number of treasures that are worth that little i've realized another uh, another crucial very basic component that we haven't explained and this floor is probably really good for it so you see that thing in the bottom right of the screen, you'll see it when I'm onto the next floor. It's called the treasure gauge. It will ping up a lot higher. So you can see the treasure gauge will start like freaking out and beeping and dinging and making all sorts of fun sounds. And that's dependent on how close I am to one of the treasures that we're looking for. 
So you can see it here, it's actually being blocked off by an enemy called an antenna beetle who's somewhere on the floor. But So in general, I'm using a mix of that treasure gauge in the bottom right and sort of my knowledge of floors to figure out what needs to be done first, what needs to be done <laughs> in between then and etc. Yeah, the treasure gauge, excuse me, the treasure gauge is extremely important for some of the, the later sublevels where there's buried treasures all over the place because you can't, you obviously can't see them, so you need the gauge to tell you where they are. Yeah. Exactly. Nice quick kill. So that was Thank Pileated Snagret, boss of this hole, uh, and it's dead before you can blink. <laughs> Again, thanks to purples doing their little shaky, stunny animation and a ton of damage. Yeah. Purples do not mess around. They take no prisoners. They don't negotiate. <laughs> they just absolutely slaughter any enemy they get their hands on. And this is a great example of that. All right. So we got the uh, Pileated Snagret. That's, yeah, the name of that boss. I'm not sure if it was said. But um, got his head money, which is worth 15, and this treasure, which is worth 100. Yeah. A lot of the boss bug bodies, so Pileated Snagret, also the body of Empress, Empress Bullblax from before, a lot of those bodies are actually worth like quite a decent amount. So like we did just say like some treasures are worth less than 20 pokos. Just that bug body that we just got is worth 15. So and it also plays no cutscene when you get it. So it's yeah. really, really worth it. <laughs> it's cherry plus. <laughs> <laughs> Much to Max's chagrin. Okay, so we should have 18. Nice. So this is the first like really serious above ground segment in the run. Um a lot of the above ground segments, actually all of the above ground segments except the early game ones, are like really tightly rooted. Um, you want to be doing a lot of things at once, uh, and that's we've basically rooted them to death because they're completely consistent every time. It's not you're not depending on random generation or anything like that. So we squeeze every last drop of of, of value we can out of them. Um, yeah. Here, Jack is going to be getting. Uh, three treasures plus a big globe, which will unlock the next area. We're not going to go there quite yet, um, but we're going to unlock it now. Um, and then entering the last cave in this area, which is called Bolax Kingdom. And as well, at the same time, we're going to be growing a ton of blue Pikmin because we'll need them later. Cool. Um, so yeah, now might be a good time. Again, I feel like we did one recently, but uh, if there's any sort of things that need to be read out or things shouted out, then now's a good time. Great, yeah. In the meantime, we got a few donations here for you. We got $20 by Nate saying, Jack is the best. <laughs> oh man, that's a, that's a bold statement. <laughs> there are a lot of people out there, <laughs> but thank you. We also got a very generous $100 by new to this 11 saying, fellow Brit here, Jack's Pikmin streams combined with copious amounts of KFC helped me survive lockdown. <laughs> Thanks for the donation, man. Good to hear from you. <laughs> and we also finally got a twelve dollars here from, and I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly. It's you, Caesar, Caesar, uh, without a comment. But thank you very much for your donation, indeed. And yeah, keep them coming, guys. Like I mentioned already, they're all going towards a great cause, and uh, we very much appreciate all of them. Thank you very much. So, um, yeah, as you can see, it's a lot going on at once in this split. We're getting a lot of Pikmin growth happening with all the enemies and these pellets that I'm collecting now. We're trying to get to a very high blue number. That's the goal because there is a gate that's underwater in the next area that's going to be our sort of big blocker between getting to these caves. Which again, as I, I keep stressing, I feel like is where the money is. We're trying to get to caves as fast as possible whilst also growing Pikmin. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's sort of the goal. But this went pretty well, I think. Yeah, no, this was pretty good. Um, so also, since uh, the last run I've done at sort of Marathon, for anyone who may have watched that at GDQ, um, we've actually had a big reroute thanks to a runner called Ice Cube. So what we used to do here was get sort of blues as we're doing now, but then we would flower them on that section over there on the basis that that would be the only time we could. But now we're going to be flowering them as part of an entirely different order of things. So we'll maybe provide a bit more insight on that once we get closer to it. But for now, what you need to know is we're doing All Black's Kingdom, which is the next cave. We're doing it with leaves, which has its own sort of nuance as leaves travel a lot slower. So uh, yeah, there'll be a lot to think about on that one. 
Yeah, right. we we used to do Bloodlax Kingdom with a whole bunch of uh, like basically the same squad, but all flowered. Now it's just now it's some leaves. Yeah, um, not some leaves can, and also reds. <laughs> yeah, and also reds. We could um, we could potentially get lucky and get like a random chance egg on one of the earlier floors in this cave. Yeah, we will still need to flower later as part of uh, value of repose above ground, but that would definitely speed up the later part of this cave, and we we kind of hope for that every time. Yeah. Exactly. So again, we're doing this luring strategy here, because uh, even with white Pikmin loaded on treasures, orange bulb orbs, their run speed is essentially higher. <laughs> and also they move their bug body back. <laughs> so we'll need to collect them because they're worth seven towards that 250 Poco total that we were talking about before. So having the bulb orb run to you, it's as fast as the treasure would have been carried anyway, but they also deliver their body right to the ship, which is quite morbid now that I think about it. but. <laughs> but you know, it's the name of the game. <laughs> cool. Alrighty. But yeah, so this cave, I think the main theme of it, again, as we had the Snagrit cave in Awakening Wood, this one, it's really about bulb orbs in sort of big sizes, little sizes. <laughs> the red bulb orb, their sort of gimmick is that they notice you a lot earlier. So it means that you really have to set up your throws with purples to make sure that they don't get a sort of sneak attack on you, basically. Is how I would summarize it. Yeah, and throwing throwing the purples like that is, it's not hard, but you can definitely sort of wind up in bad positions where uh, your Pikmin are, you know, either you don't get a stun and you're too close to the Bulb Orb and it can sort of just lean down and take a big bite, um, or, you know, it, it shakes them off and then any nearby enemies or the Bulb Orb itself can, can take a bite out of them. Can and that is really unfortunate. We, we try not to lose any Pikmin, of course, because they're cute and they're lovely and they're friends, <laughs> but also because we don't have that many opportunities to grow Pikmin. Growing Pikmin is slow, and any Pikmin that you lose are just like dead for the rest of the run. There's yeah. usually no way to recover them without losing a bunch of time. Yeah, it's sort of the art of getting to what I would describe as like a mid-level of competency at the speed run. It's like doing things correctly, but also trying not to lose too many Pikmin ever or have any disasters. So of course we need to be fast, but Hey, if we if we mess <laughs> if we lose Pikmin with as a result of a mistake, we can't go fast for the rest of the run because you just need a lot of Pikmin to be able to carry out tasks. Yeah, especially purples and whites. Oh, this sort of becomes less important later into the run because you know, like when you're in the last cave, like who cares? You lose one Pikmin, it's like doesn't yeah. matter if it gains you five seconds, then that's a net win. But this early, we are being very careful. Yeah, because we still have a lot of game to go. Oh, I think I misread the radar. It's unfortunate. Oh, yeah. I did. I think it's next to that electric. Yeah, uh, so this this floor is kind of hard to read. Um, we mentioned earlier, like near the beginning of the run, that you can kind of like sort of read the RNG for a lot of sub-levels. There are some situations where you just can't, however, um, and treasures inside of enemies is one of, those, one of those instances. So just based on how the game generates levels, the system we use to sort of predict how it's going to generate things, we call that score. And score doesn't really care about where it places enemies. Yeah. Um, and for enemies that have treasures in them, it's just completely random. So we were like completely on the gauge. Exactly. So it's, a, it's the only time where your knowledge only helps because you know where the enemies vaguely can spawn, but you're not sure about <laughs> yeah exactly which enemies you need to spawn. It can be sort of random. So for instance, when Kemi was talking about things that contribute to score, like, it's just a bunch of little things and there's a lot of nuance to it, but like the headline items are, the game wants you to go far away from the sort of spawn area. It wants you to go further into the floor and also it gives higher score to places in general where there are more enemies. So the game tries to put you in the thick of it basically and say, <laughs> you have to salvage the treasures, not just sort of find them 10 meters away from something scary. Exactly, yeah. So like the big two for score are how far away is the location and how many enemies are there between you and there. Um, by you, I mean the ship where you spawn in. Um, and for each enemy and each like unit of distance that you go, uh, the game will give it more score and make it more likely to put treasures there. Like here, for example, and in a lot of sublevels, you'll actually see one, at least one treasure and the hole to the next floor, like quite close to each other. And that's because it will also put the hole at the highest score location on the floor. Yeah, so this floor was really good in terms of um, RNG. And it was also nice because I could see when I got a little preview of the floor, I could see where this skull was. 
So it helped me plan a lot. So when I landed on the floor, I saw the bulb here as a result of this treasure gauge, and I knew that it had one of the treasures, and I saw the skull. So I just sort of made a game plan on that basis and executed it. So yeah, good floor overall. Apart from the little mistake on four, this has actually been quite nice. And here it's worth waiting for um, this orange bulb bulb to get into the pod because we're only going to be waiting like a couple seconds and it's worth seven pokos. So that's yeah. quite important overall. But then the little one behind it is only worth two. So waiting another two seconds for that. D le I don't know. <laughs> less clear. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah, you can if you really need it. But like sort of going back to pokos per second for the big bulb orb there, we waited about three seconds extra to get it in and got seven pokos. So that's what, 2.25 2. Yeah. or something like that? Yeah. I don't know, I can't do math. Um, <laughs> whereas the little bulb would be like 1.0 pokos per second, which is eh. All right, S some serious time for a big boss coming up. <laughs> oh yeah, this is the hardest boss fight in the game. Um, you start you start the fight off by throwing a ton of purples and then leaving immediately. Because uh, the purples the buffered all the damage and he died instantly. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> very well programmed boss. That was Emperor Bulblex. Uh, Emphasis on the was. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we're going to abuse the knapsack glitch here again to sort of path us up walls. And we'll get this last treasure here, which is one of the most expensive ones. And for Animal Crossing fans out there, you're vaguely familiar with what it is. Uh, fun fact, this is actually not an Animal Crossing reference. No, this is it's a reference. It's a, yes, yeah, so like, <laughs> I don't know exactly the history of it, but this is like an item that, like a, a popular item in, a, in Japanese museums, I believe. Um, mm -hmm. or it closely resembles it. I don't know if the Animal Crossing ones are, uh, if, if the gyroids in Animal Crossing have any like relation to this item as well, but in this game, I'm pretty sure it's meant to be a reference to this real yeah, life yeah. museum item. I was about to say, I think Animal Crossing would have only come out like what, a year or two before? <laughs> Cause this was, it was like 2004, this game came out. So I'm not sure what Animal Crossing did, but they shared the same console. So it would be <laughs> remarkable if it was based on that. But yeah, it's cool. I actually didn't know that. <laughs> Every day is a school day. <laughs> but yeah, so this floor was worth 365 pokos between this treasure, the treasure inside Emperor Ball Blacks, and his bug body. So I think it takes about two minutes, which is 120 seconds. And then if you do the maths on that, it's like almost three pokos per second. So, yeah. you know, it's sort of a, a gimme. This is one of the touch points where... Uh, we're sort of looking at how many pokos we have as we leave this cave to determine our pace. Yeah. Um, so we have 4936, I believe. I sort of the ideal we want to have... 34. Yeah. yeah. The ideal we want to have is 4940 right here. Mm -hmm. So we're on really good pace, um, yeah. really good poco pace. Uh, this is just keeping track of basically how many bug bodies we've gotten through the run. Um, if you're like really low at this point, then uh, that's sort of when you would want to consider getting like some of the smaller optional treasures later in the run to like bring you back onto pace. Yeah, like you you never want to get those additionals because in time, like in addition to the cutscene time, which is 10 seconds, as we spoke about before, you have to go and grab them. And there's not very many treasures that are like really efficient to grab at this point, sort of alongside ones you're getting with like a couple of exceptions. So I'm um, here, this is the start of the big new reroute. So the basic thing you need to know in terms of the biggest routing challenge in Pikmin 2 is the first treasure you collect in the Valley of Repose, which is the area we're in now, it automatically forces the day to end. Which is not great because the sort of end of day fanfare is about a minute and a half and you achieve nothing by doing it really. So you basically just have to spend a minute and a half resetting everything, getting all the Pikmin out again, and it's just... It's not good. So we try and like collect the first treasure in this area in a sort of efficient way. So here we're doing it while we flower the blues, which we didn't flower on the previous like split when we entered Ball Black's Kingdom, but saved time by not flowering them here. Whereas like if we're doing it here, it's relatively efficient as a spend of time. Yeah. So that's sort of the thinking. As you can see, it's sort of this time is the only dead time. The reason the day is forced to end, by the way, is because you're meant to get your first treasure in this area during the tutorial, which we skipped. So the game sort of checks like, oh, is this your first treasure in the area? Well, you must be in the tutorial. Uh, time to teach you about the day ending and having in the map screen, which you've clearly never seen before. <laughs> um, let's force the day to end just to sort of instruct you. Um, 
And we don't really have a way to skip this that we know of, so we kind of just have to make the best of it. This is still significantly faster than playing through the tutorial, though. Yeah. Um, as a heads up to the host, if you still wanted to switch, now would be a very good time, because this above section is relatively simple, but I'm not sure. <laughs> All right, yeah, I will do that in just a second. I just want to read one more donation before of I course. leave. Yeah, please do. Uh, we got $25 here from Blood Dive saying, Pikmin is love. Great event again for a great cause. Thank you uh, so far and good luck for all the following runners. And a something special about this donation, um, there's a little German part at the end um, referencing the, the German restream. And I just want to give a quick shout out to all of our restreams. If you want to know more about our restream, I think we have a chat command. It's, I think it's exclamation point restreams. I think we're restreaming in five different languages. So uh, a huge shout out to all of the restreams here. As somebody who has done a little bit of German restreaming in the past. So uh, they're, doing, they're doing great work and they deserve a quick shout out. Um, but yes, this is the end of my hosting shift. I will be handing over the mic to my buddy Polister, who you all know as the guy who's telling you to buy like ESA t-shirts in every intermission. So, uh, yeah, he's going to do a great work. And uh, yeah, thanks for having me, ESA. Yeah, thanks so much for joining me as well for the run. <laughs> yeah, and uh, Jack, good luck for uh, the rest of the run. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, please enjoy, everybody. See, uh, see you like, uh, next time. Cool. So this above ground route is the new route, as Jack mentioned. Uh, this was routed in, I think it was March of this year. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, so relatively new. Uh, we estimate that the new route in total saves about 45 seconds of the old route. Um, this valley of repose above ground is like the significant portion of that. Um, or the significant portion of what changed. Um, basically, what we used to do is like rush straight to the first cave here, which is subterranean complex, um, and then rush to the second cave, which is frontier cavern, and then sort of after that, you would clean up all the above ground treasures and then end the day. Uh, here, what we do now is um, we try to get most of the above ground treasures moving, uh, all of them actually, uh, while we enter subterranean complex. Because in order to enter subterranean complex, we have to take down that wall that was underwater. We have to break the plug, which is keeping water like there where the gate was. And then we have to build this bridge. Um, and if this was a new glitches run, we would also have to take down a gate, but thankfully we can skip that with another knapsack exploit. Indeed. But yeah, we still have just a ton of things that we need to do. And it's pretty efficient to, to just get all the treasures moving while we do that. Ah. So the one execution test for this route is if you do everything correctly, so those throws that I did earlier, I had to redo once or twice, then you won't get interrupted here. So this is something that's sort of invisible when you're watching the game from a more casual perspective. But the game has this mechanic called lockout, where a second after every cutscene like this, you can't input anything on your controller apart from movement. Not sure why, but kind of a pain, <laughs> to be honest. So um, it's something the runners of the game have to work around, and it's something that is the source of much frustration, I think, sort of in the early days when you forget that it's something that you have to think about. Yeah, it can really mess you up. I've personally lost runs to uh, like Pikmin running into electric hazards, for example, during the lockouts, like after treasure cutscenes and stuff. It's really brutal if you don't know to plan ahead for it. Yeah, like Pikmin can die instantly. <laughs> and even without electricity, I think that, as Kemi said, that's probably the best example, but they can die incredibly quickly so even a second can be it that can be like all of your pikmin just gone yep oh did you miss some purples you're only entering with 90. i might be i might have i'll, I'll check in the first floor that was weird yeah. so this is subterranean complex um a lot of new runners sort of regard this as the hardest cave in the run uh a lot of experienced runners regard it as the hardest cave in the run as well uh there's a few contenders for that but basically this cave is really seriously going to test execution and ability to tightly manage your Pikmin squad. There's a lot of explosives in this cave, there's a lot of electricity, there's a lot of things that can instantly kill tons and tons of your Pikmin if you don't have like really good positioning. Yeah. Um, so we'll see a bit more of that on the next floor and then from then onwards, but that's that's sort of what to, what to expect here. Um, yeah, lots of stress. It's an notorious run killer, yeah. 
Yeah. But the good kind of stress, the kind of stress that keeps us playing the game in some weird, <laughs> I don't know, some weird way. <laughs> so here I'm just sort of clearing the path. Oop. So um, yeah, the reason that I played this floor sort of the way I did, there was that poison geyser there, and I knew that this Nuvo, or this treasure is called the Nuvo table, it would have to path back over it. So I had to sort of set a plan to make sure that poison hazard wouldn't interfere with things later on. Just in case anyone saw why I threw that white pigment to the left, for yeah. seemingly no reason. Yeah, this was kind of a, an unfortunate layout. Um, a lot of the time, this this floor can be laid out such that you can sort of instantly read it on the come down. For example, if um, this sort of stump room where the hole was was like closer to spawn, like you could have seen it on the come down. Um, and you could see the hole in it, but nothing else, then you would know for a fact that the Nouveau table would be in there. Yeah. Um, which is one of those things, it's like a rule of thumb that you can that you can use where like, you can just completely cleanly read the floor on the come down and then play it really efficiently because you have a game plan before you even started. So yeah, all of these little uh, like grayish things on the floor are bombs. Uh, Free stray Pikmin will run over and hit them, and then they will explode after a short timer. So, <laughs> very, because, very free, because free stray Pikmin are stupid. <laughs> yeah, is basically so... why they see like a landmine and they're like, "Ooh, that's for me," <laughs> yeah, and they exactly. charge straight at it. So we have to make them fight their absolute base urges on that front. <laughs> yeah, they'll do a lot of things. They'll hit bombs, but they'll also like run up and hit anode beetles, which are some electric enemies you saw in Bulbuck's Kingdom. Um, and then those anode beetles will like spark and create electricity, and then they will instantly zap any Pikmin around them. Yeah, um, they pick so, fights with people they shouldn't. <laughs> That's yeah, I mean. Pikmin have a tendency to kill themselves, so you have to be you have to keep a pretty tight control over them most of the run. Again, a hundred stupid school kids. <laughs> Think about it that way. It's ugh, how I do in my most resentful moments. So this is probably one of the most complicated flaws in terms of how it will generate. So there. Okay, so there are three things we need to do. We need to kill a beetle on this floor that has a treasure in it. And then we need to get two other treasures that are sort of just hanging around. So we've got to organize our time to do that as best as possible. So here, this is the beetle. What you saw Jack do just there was like dismiss his squad uh, on top of a fire geyser here. Um, when you dismiss on a squad like that, or on a fire geyser, they'll all run over and hit the nearest thing once before they can sort of jump into it and get hit by the fire. So if you have a fire geyser that's on a bad cycle, you can just dismiss on it, and it'll usually set fire to some of your Pikmin, but you can also just get rid of it really quickly, which is quite convenient. Well, that was a little bit of drama there. I think the boulder was maybe pixels away from <laughs> squishing some poor purple Pikmin in my party. God. If you spawn into the world of Pikmin as a speedrunner's blue Pikmin, <laughs> that's probably the lowest ranking. <laughs> so essentially what I'm trying to say with that is blue Pikmin lives are sort of less valuable. Like we can lose some blue Pikmin and it's not the end of the world. Of course we love all Pikmin, but <laughs> in terms of losing Pikmin as we go through, purples and whites are the ones where it will impact directly on our ability to clear floors quickly. Yeah, 99% of the reason we grew so many blue Pikmin is for that gate that was in the above ground. Yeah. Um, and so now that we've taken down that gate, we kind of don't care anymore. Like, obviously we don't want to lose them because they're good for killing things, they're good for carrying things. But if there's going to be mandatory deaths, or not mandatory, but if, if an accident happens and it's only blue Pikmin that die, uh, that's fine for the most part. Yeah, like for context, the world record loses about 10 to 15 blues or no 15 to 20 blues honestly it loses quite a lot but after a certain point it just doesn't impact on the bottom line so uh yeah helpful so here this is the final stint of white pikmin growth or i think any pikmin growth really actually yeah this is so, also um, one of the only floors in the run we played that has no treasures on it um yeah it's just that worth it to grow 15 extra white pikmin here or are you yeah. only going to go 10? Yeah, I'm going to go 10, just because the other flower is quite far away. So the sort of, the theory is in my idea, in, or in my head, is that um, say, the time I will save from not having to grow those five all the way on the other side of the room won't, oh, I don't know, it'll be more time saved than those five Pikmin would speed up the rest of the treasures. Because we still have 30 white Pikmin, 
So different runners have different preferences again, but for me, I'm very much a <laughs> get me out of here as soon as possible. Yeah, for sure. Like the thing to consider is that, oh, unfortunate. <laughs> I got uh, that slipped. Was, that was a minor skip that Jack just attempt called Rimwalk. It saves like six seconds or something like that. Not a big deal if you fail it. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Uh, so growing extra whites, it's like the thing to consider is that a lot of treasures are going to be, they're going to weigh less than 30, like overall. So any whites you have above 30 are like less useful at that point. Yeah. Like if, if like the total number of Pikmin you can have carrying things on a floor is 40 or less, there's a good chance that having those five extra whites isn't going to be a big deal. Yeah. So this is... A sort of infamous floor, I think it's probably the hardest one in the game, Subterranean Complex 6. So the reason this is stressful is because of this. There are bombs, poison, and electricity all on top of one another. So bombs and electricity will kill Pikmin instantly. Don't, again, don't care about your feelings. Uh, but poison also stops your Pikmin being able to reach certain spaces. So when you combine those two together, you can't really protect your Pikmin from the bombs and electricity because you can't get to the spaces in time. Ooh. Heck. There you go. Yeah, it's, so it's very to... stressful. You can, if your Pikmin get poisoned, they also kind of like fly off in other directions and sort of like waddle around, kind of like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, which makes them very hard to recover. Like if they go off into a, a pile of enemies, then they're kind of just dead. Exactly, yeah. So uh, if you want to try and avoid Oh, I thought I... Okay, this is a little stressful, but we're... <laughs> As you can see, there's a bit of carnage as well. So on top of those two things, thankfully we didn't have to interact with too much of the floor because I had the camera zoomed in, which deloads enemies on stressful floors like these. Which is a, a very useful mechanic, which I guess is only really relevant now. Ah, so there you can see two white deaths. Which is not ideal, but when we were sorting those treasures from before, I obviously left behind two whites and wasn't aware. So they were left at the mercy of the electric or the Anno Beetles and they died. Yeah, it's unfortunate, but you kind of expect to lose a couple Pikmin on this floor just because it's so hectic and so chaotic. And you can obviously, you know, take it slow and safe and not lose anyone, but we're speedrunners, we need to go fast. And if that means losing a couple Pikmin, it's very sad, but we, but we gotta do it, you know? They will be remembered in Valhalla, that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All of him. Okay. Exactly. So this far, this far yes. we get a couple side characters here. We have uh, this wonderful Gatlin Grunk up on her tower. We call her Juliet. And then we have that other guy down there uh, who roams around the floor, and so we call him Romeo. Um, we really don't like Romeo. Romeo's not our friend. Um, <laughs> you in particular hate Romeo. <laughs> uh, really Romeo is very much not your friend. <laughs> uh, if so Romeo will run around the floor, and those Grinks, uh, Jack dodged them very well, but if uh, they do manage to hit your Pikmin, they can just devastate your squad. That attack they shoot, it's like an explosive attack, um, and if they land like a really solid hit, they can just completely devastate your squad. Yeah, and even if they don't devastate, because I think it's like one in three of the shots is lethal, the rest are just sort of explosions even if they just hit you with the explosions that will like dismiss your pikmin and make them go idle and as we spoke about before idle pikmin often are dead pikmin so <laughs> you have to sort of juggle both of those facts together yeah for sure and especially considering that there's tons of bombs on this floor it's your pikmin get sprayed around they become idle they hit all of the bombs around you and then you're sort of just between a rock and 400 bombs yeah, <laughs> you have a chain reaction caused by a bunch of idiots that kills the idiots involved, basically. Yeah, exactly. Like, this floor can go so wrong in so many ways. It's It can it can be a real disaster. It's kind of or, beautiful, actually, how wrong it can go. <laughs> yeah, or, like, in this, this floor, this can be really, really good, actually. Yes, I was literally about to say, uh, Romeo and Juliet, both very close <laughs> to the spawn area, and their bodies are worth seven, too. So killing them is worth the money. And also the other two treasures, which was the tape and the lid, they were both really close. So that floor can be really massive because the sort of ring rooms and the tiles that the game will sort of place when it randomly makes a floor can be really big. But all of those are like the smallest tiles the games can use for that floor. So uh, yeah, really good. Really, yeah. really good. 
that would be really like fantastic. world record quality RNG. There you go. If you want me to <laughs> use, use a buzz phrase for it. And also fun fact, um, that sort of green lid that we got is the most expensive treasure in the run. It's worth 300. I lo it's so it's so underwhelming and unspectacular, but yes, it is. It's a very expensive treasure. Uh, yeah, it's just setting up those purples. Kemi, thank you for the the point out on the way in. Oh yeah. Um, well, it's, it's Thirst Activator. It's iconic. <laughs> that's true. That's true. We have a soft spot for it, but... Oh, okay. Is that enough? Yeah, that'll be fine. I Perfect. suspect. Yeah, Sorry. so that's the one treasure that we didn't manage to collect, um, like, fully collect on entering SCX. Um, that's intentional. That's, like, how the route is supposed to go. So we just sort of load it up there on the way to the next cave. Um, yep. And that's going to get in, like, just before we enter the hole, ideally. <laughs> It's the goal, but I, I do think looking now, I put probably too few Pikmin on it, so it might be moving a little slower. But if so, I think yeah. I'll, I'll just wait for the collection. Yeah, it's usually better to wait for it here as opposed to like enter the cave and then get it when you when you finish the cave, because if you get it when you finish the cave, that means you have to like, you know, you have like a lockout when you land, and then you also have, um, like you have to spend the time to like load your Pikmin back on it, which does take time. So. Right now it's moving and it's better to let it just keep moving rather than try to stop it and start it again. Yeah, so I mean, well, we'll see how, how true that ends up being, but the number I normally try and put on it is 25 and I put about 18 on. So it was moving some proportion slower than I would have liked, which is why I had to wait, but it's okay. I think that probably cost about like four or five seconds or something. Yeah, which, not a huge obviously, deal. If you're, if you're absolutely grinding and sweating your butt off for uh, a personal best then might be kind of annoying but okay so frontier cavern a very stressful sub level or very stressful cave sorry uh, there's just lots and lots and lots of enemies and very advanced stuff this is when the game starts testing you on like okay how well can you deal with some of these harder enemies that we're throwing at you yeah if subtraining complex is meant to test your like execution and your tight pikmin control Frontier Cavern is testing like your ability to read floors and to plan really, really well ahead of time. Um, personally, I find this to be the hardest cave in the game, as opposed to Subtraining Complex, um, yeah. just due to my skill set. Like most people, find one of these two caves to be the hardest. Um, really, just down to your style. Uh, every runner has a really distinct and different style, which I find really interesting and fun. Especially when we do like set seed races each week, uh, it's mm -hmm. cool to see how other people will play the same exact floor and see like some very different ways that people can come up with uh, yeah. of playing them sometimes. Like people will definitely like share strategies as well. And like sometimes you can look at someone else's style and be like, even though that's not how I would play it or something similar, it's so much faster. I need to sort of change how I'm playing and it's great. <laughs> There's a lot of collaboration. I think we've sort of gotten better at the game together as a community just in terms of how much we talk about <laughs> sub-levels and things like this, which is really cool. Yeah, for sure. Like, when I when I started running this game, like, you know, obviously I was learning a lot from other runners, but, like, within a few months of starting, uh, like, I was already sort of contributing small, small ideas, but, like, little things that a lot of the top runners said they liked. Um, Indeed. So, yeah, it's just, like, little things of style. Like, there's no, like, objective fastest way to play this game in most instances. It's really more of an art. Indeed. <laughs> yeah, I like that. <laughs> it's a very, uh, a very generous description of my favorite game. <laughs> but yeah. So uh, this might be a bit stressful, but I figured that it's probably worth getting these two loaded before killing the enemies. As a rule of thumb, we like... How did he die? <laughs> Sorry, uh -huh. did anyone see what killed him? <laughs> oh, I guess his own boulder probably killed him off screen. Oh, that's that very was weird. probably it, yeah. It's very weird. But yeah, as a general rule of thumb, killing enemies... The time you spend doing that is time that you're not getting to the treasure, loading it immediately, and doing everything related to that. So we'll try and avoid enemies as much as possible, even though on that floor, most people who played it casually probably like saw cannon beetles, went, oh, cower, like run, like sort of, <laughs> you know, make game plans for it. Whereas we just zoom past because we're like, we need to get the treasures moving and then just try and prevent anyone from dying on the way back. Yeah. Uh, you could probably see that Jack is making good use of deloading the cannon beetles there as well. Mm -hmm. So if you keep them off screen, even if they're like right next to you, uh, as long as they're off screen, they won't be able to attack you or move or shoot. Uh, yeah, I think the, 
The only things that can load enemies are um, sort of the captains and their view. So that's as what Kemi's talking about there. Or there is um, Pikmin. Have like they have tiny little load zones around their little bodies so that can load enemies. <laughs> so it can be kind of annoying, but it's something you just have to think about. Okay, so but Bull Bear is an exception to this. This guy is called Giant Bull Bear. I will accept Ooh. those deaths. That's fine. Yeah, that was all blues. So okay. very sad. Oh no, that's one white. Okay. Um, so as you can see in that lockout, he closed the gap, so I couldn't make the purple stun him in that time. So that's a good example actually of like how lockout can be quite a pain. Okay, but yeah, as you can see, it's a busy floor. <laughs> okay, so we need to find a buried treasure and a candle. So the buried treasure should be here. Okay, so now we're looking for a candle. I think it's over there. Yeah. This is one of the most complex floors in the run. Um, this one, like, really, really hard tests your ability to read the floor, especially with the buried treasure, because that one usually takes the longest to get in. You have to dig it up and then carry it all the way back. Um, so if you can't, like, really quickly determine where that buried treasure is, you're going to have a hard time. This floor is going to be quite slow. Uh, Jack is really good at figuring out where it is, of course. Okay, um, yep. But yeah, this this can be just like a super rough floor, like especially if you get a misread where you, you know, like it's sort of a split layout and you go the wrong way, then it's just like, ugh. Yeah, because if you go the wrong way, sort of on the merit of what I said before, all the time you spend walking to where you think this buried treasure might be, of course you can't see it from far away, all the time you spend walking to that and not walking to where it actually is, is basically pure time loss. So if you have a really good sense for where things are, you're rewarded. <laughs> I guess would be how I'd try and explain it. But we also got the um, bug bodies for the ball bear and a couple of his little friends. So that's quite good. The ball bear's worth 10 bugs. So he's definitely worth picking up. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Wasn't too bad, actually, despite a few deaths. I think I lost two whites and five blues. But at this stage, as we talked about before, five blues, they've served their job. They'll be remembered fondly. Yeah. So for context, this is the third to last cave in the run. So there's still probably about... 20 to 30 minutes left in the run um yeah but yeah so this is the third to last cave it's not you know, we, we still don't want to lose pikmin of course but it's less of a big deal than it would have been like in the previous cave because this cave especially benefits from having like a full party yeah exactly oh i was just uh making sure so this cave is described by many both casually and in the speedrun scene as the worst floor in the game sorry i think i said cave i meant this sub level in particular so this is frontier frontier cavern four is described as the worst because these guys here i got quite a fortunate layout but they scoop you up like this and when they scoop you up like this your pikmin dismiss and when your pikmin dismiss after this cutscene, I will show you what they like to do. <laughs> I think we sort of alluded to it before, but this is a really good example of how cruel the game designers were. So they'll run over to these guys, have a little cuddle, and they'll kill all of them. So you can regularly see, I think there are a few famous clips in the community of people just like screaming because they realize they've lost like 50 Pikmin in like a second. <laughs> Yeah. The really sadistic part about this floor is that you know they're dead like five seconds before it happens. Yeah. You're just sort of floating above them being like, no, run away. <laughs> Any <laughs> other direction, please. But yeah, but we, we navigated it okay, and that was, that was very good, very fortunate. It's quite a, a generous layout. The game didn't really roll its sleeves up and try and brutalize me this time, which is good. Love to see that. Okay, so these enemies are called Mamutas. They can't do anything lethal to Pikmin, but they can bury your Pikmin. So much like when we were growing our squad sort of earlier in the run they'll do that so we have to spend all the time going under the ground and um plucking them up again <laughs> which is again it can just be pure time loss if they bury like a lot of pikmin so you do have to be quite careful yeah if it's one or two it's okay um mm -hmm. but yeah like i've definitely spent way too long on this floor sometimes just sitting there plucking Pikmin after the treasures have come in. And the thing is, um, when you go to the next sub-level, we didn't really talk about this, but when you go to the next sub-level, all of your Pikmin will come with you no matter where they are, yeah. unless they are buried in the ground. So you do have to pluck them. Yeah, that's a that's a very good point, actually, to clarify. Um, ooh, okay, so this person might... This Boldmin here, we didn't really talk about them because they're not super relevant for payoff debt. They are for other categories, but we don't pick them up. So they're sort of a 
different weird breed of like parasitic Pikmin that like lodge inside ball ball bodies and control them. It's kind of gross, but they're really cute. So we like them. But um, they aren't affected by deloading like that mechanic we've spoken about before. So even if you keep them off camera, they have their own little brains and their own little conscious thoughts and they'll just wander the floors by themselves. So uh, they can sometimes be a bit scary, but... Exactly, yeah. They are roaming enemies, um, so big bull bears are roaming enemies. Uh, Romeo from earlier is a roaming enemy. That just means they keep going no matter what you do to them. They will ruin your day whether you want them to or not. Oh, whoops, those are blues. Okay, oh. Okay. I do not have my Pikmin with me. This is fine. <laughs> this is fine, nobody panic. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you want to panic, in which case I can't stop you. But yeah, so you can see what I meant about the orange ball balls being quite stressful. Because they'll see you from very far away and then make their make their sweet little way over. And you're like, thanks for popping by, but you you are not welcome. <laughs> <laughs> to be polite about it. Okay, so now I'm just gonna try and mop up the rest of the bog bodies that I can get without having to spend time doing it. Because I'm conscious that we're going to need quite a bit of money in the last bit of the game. I think at the moment. It's looking like we're going to need about 22 extra bodies. And that's just working out how much this treasure is, you know, gonna cost, basically, and how much treasures there are left that I can actually get, like collect in the game. So it's something between those two, and we have a figure that we're working to. Okay. Yeah. Out of this cave, we're aiming for, like, really ideally, 8,100 bokos. Yeah. Uh, it's very rare to actually be at that point, unless you've got bonus treasures. Um, yeah. But if you're, like, 20 to 30 down from that, you can collect that many bug bodies to make up for it in the last two caves. And that's yeah. sort of like the expected, like where an average run is going to be. Exactly. That number basically means you're good to go. Don't even worry about bugs for the rest of the run. You're completely fine. Which uh, are yeah. very comfortable, but probably not <laughs> an efficient spend of time. Okay, so we lost 14 Pikmin overall. I'm fairly certain the majority of them are blues, because if a... As well, it's kind of a complicated mechanic, but I guess I'll explain it now. It's... um. If an enemy, kind of like the ball bear, very big, bites into like a crowd of your Pikmin, it will just kill blues first. The game has like a sort of pecking order for like Pikmin that will get eaten by enemies if, if they occupy the same spot on the hitbox and stuff. So if a ball bear bites into a crowd, what you need to know is he'll pick five blues first, if he can. So I suspect that's what happened on, uh, I think it was Frontier Cabin 3. So uh, yeah, again, blue is disposable. <laughs> All right, final area, perplexing pool. And we're 80% of the way through and I need to get 20 bugs. So they're the sort of headline items that I'm thinking about at this point. Yeah, so in, in this first cave in this area, there is a backup treasure on the first cave. It's called Love Nugget. It's a big tomato. We love Love Nugget. Um, <laughs> It's worth 40 pokos, and if you're really down on bug bodies, that's the best thing to get, usually. Um, just to, like, you know, bring yourself back up to pace, because you really want to pay off the debt after the last cave. If you have to go and get, like, a backup treasure above ground, that's really slow. Way slower than getting Love Nugget. Um, as a side thought as well, now might be a good time if there are any sort of announcements or donations that need to be read. I think I've got a good, like, minute. I was just about to jump in and ask if there's a moment, so yeah, here's a few messages. Oh, first of all, hi, I'm Paul Lister, and for the next uh, however many runs, I'll be reading your fascinating, amazing, generous donations. Uh, like this $5 from Max25 saying, come on, Jack, you got this, mate. <laughs> and also $75 from Clockwork Netty without any comment. Uh, but thank you both for your wow. uh, donations, my friends. Hi, uh, I should probably mention at this point that with those donations, you guys enter yourselves at uh, some amazing prize draws. For example, a uh, This Is The Run controller custom made. Uh, with an ESA theme, it is absolutely beautiful. And if you donate $30 throughout the event, um, not just in one donation, but cumulatively, you can enter the draw for that. There's also two ViewSonic Elite monitors, one at $25 minimum donation, one at $35. So you can get those donations in for that. And our big prize, a Sony PlayStation 5 and Ratchet and & Clank Rift Apart. And that's a minimum of $50. So if you raise $50 throughout the event, you're in the draw for that. So yeah, get those donations in and hopefully you can win some amazing prizes. Uh, back to you folks. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a bunch. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so, uh, <laughs> Kemi, I'm not sure if you saw my face when I landed on the floor, but I was very surprised by where the exit was. The game <laughs> generated, like, a very long corridor, and I was quite taken aback by it, I guess. But, um, but yeah, either way, this is a COS 3. There are three treasures that we need to get on this floor that I'm just, I think have all come up now. Uh, it's kind of a small floor, so there isn't much multitasking to do. It's sort of just, uh, run, grab everything. <laughs> Essentially is the thinking so uh, but I do need to get some bugs. So we're gonna try and get this guy And I'll happily wait the two seconds for this Wally Wally Wog body because it's worth uh, five pokers So uh, and it should get into the ship quite quickly. So it's cool with me We have yeah. to get 20 anyway It's not like I can negotiate with the game and be like can I just do nine nine thousand nine hundred and eighty this time like you have to get it so if you if you have to take a bit more of a time cost to get some bug money at this stage it's still worth it. Yeah. Okay. Ooh, weird floor. Okay, so oh, there's a gate. pretty good, actually. Yeah, I think it's an interesting one. So we can try and garner some information. So you can see the treasure gauge is pinging up here. There's a buried treasure on this floor that we have to think about. But you could see since the treasure gauge sort of went up as I went that way, that means there's something there of interest. Oh, I got! I can't believe I got that throw. Sorry. <laughs> so the bumble, those enemies are called bumbling snitch bugs. They're kind of a pain in the butt because they can float like right above your Pikmin's carry heights quite often. So they can actually be like weirdly difficult to collect. Oh, there might be a gate. Sorry, just thinking. Yeah, this is a really solid four though. Um, kind of what you're looking for here in terms of like the generation is. If you see this big can treasure that's like out in the open rather than in an alcove, that usually indicates you're going to have a pretty good floor, mostly gateless. There are two gates that generate on this floor, and you ideally want neither the treasures nor the gate or nor the the exit hole to be behind one of the gates because it takes a while to take them down. Um, yeah. So if you see the the like can out in the open there, that what that basically indicates is that there are no available alcoves. Um, so the game like can't tuck them away behind a gate and we know for a fact that when I spawn in that was that gate I had to look at initially but it means that I won't have to knock down any gates to get to treasures which again are the things we need to move as soon as possible. So if we can get them moving then anything else we do a la destroying this gate anything else we need to do can be quite efficient. Yeah, so with just hold behind the gate, like you can just do that while the treasures are moving, and that's that's the best case. Obviously, no gate is the best case, but if anything is going to be gated, hole is better than treasures. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I'm actually going to check where the exit is because I can't tell. So this floor, we don't get any treasures, and it's a pain in the butt because gates can still spawn here and take away time, which they have done. So you can see here, I'm sort of trying to get rid of enemies to not have too many deaths, but he'll get a blue if he gets anyone. Nah, yeah. he didn't get anyone, so that's fine. This is one of the few floors in the run with optional treasures that you'll get sometimes, if they're worth it. Um, so there's Press one here it. called Time Capsule. It's actually right there, but it's not going to be worth it because it's too far from the ship. Um, there are a few places in the run where you can get optional treasures, and what that does is it sort of gives you extra pokos that you can use to skip treasures later on. Uh, there's sort of one go-to skip that we're going to get after this cave. Um, mm -hmm. But if you're like even... Even if you have even more pokos than that, you can skip treasures in the last cave. Um, or if you're really, really like chancing it, I guess you can skip treasures in earlier caves uh, on certain floors, like Frontier Cavern Two, stuff like that. Uh, that can save a lot of time. So in today's episode of Purples are really broken. There, we just killed him. You're meant to have a, a Pikmin, that, Pikmin type that shall not be named. Yellows. You meant to have yellows to kill him. I'm sorry, I had to name it. I realized there might actually be people that are like, wait, what Pikmin? Um, so you're normally meant to have a type of Pikmin that can be thrown a bit higher. And you can see his body was quite high off the ground. But again, purples do literally so much damage that you can just destroy him. And even if it doesn't destroy him on the first round, the sort of pound damage that they can do can hit the feet. And then that counts as damage on the main body for some reason, even though it's definitely not intended. <laughs> yeah, so, it's uh, just... It's truly broken, truly, truly broken. Yeah. And that was three steps, by the way, Jack. Pretty good. Oh, three steps. Nice. But he didn't shake either, so... Yeah, no shake in three steps. That's pretty good. Nice. Yeah, so I've kind of been memeing about um, <laughs> like the number of steps that BD Longlegs will take before you kill it. Two steps is sort of, like, ideal. 
three steps is pretty solid as well. Um, mm. If you like miss those purple throws, they are kind of precise on its feet. Uh, if you miss them, it could end up taking like six or seven steps, which is quite slow. Um, but I'm sort of just like <laughs> messing about with that. Kemi's the guardian of destroying BD long legs. <laughs> that's because that's my current PB has one step. Oh, that's good. That's the only reason I'm like getting getting all crazy about it. <laughs> it's your PB's you best gotta get thing. Mine. You gotta get mine. Oh, I do have to get mine. Thank oh, you. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. God, I completely forgot. So again, as uh, Max has very, very, very helpfully pointed out, in world record runs, we do not normally get this treasure because it's a little slower than one that we would get earlier on. But um, <laughs> but of course, we need to make that money, right? So it doesn't matter. It absolutely does not matter if I don't want to get it or if it's slow. I have to. So yeah. there it is. So That's world record pace. At world record pace, it is fastest to get an optional treasure on Snaggered Hole sub level 6, um, which we didn't get this run. Um, for Due to a combination of factors, it's gettable sometimes and not gettable other times, and generally it is not worth it to spend that much time like searching around for it. Um, so sometimes you get it, sometimes you don't. If you do get it, you would not get that treasure that we just got there. Um, just because the, 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 the lens on Snaggered Hole 6 is worth actually more than that and if you can get it faster than the 40 seconds it takes to get aquatic mine then that's just free time save yeah and sometimes it can literally cost like no time to get like it'll cost literally 10 seconds so that's just a free 30 seconds of time save yeah so that's why well most like world record runs or like very high level runs you see will have it yeah and this is the last sort of poco pace uh moment in the run uh we're looking for 8840 we are six shy of that, so we're basically on on perfect pace. Yeah, eight thousand eight hundred and forty is assuming you get like zero bug bodies in this cave, um, except for one bull bear body and the body of the boss. Yeah, so three is like it's barely on my radar as a concern. I just have to make sure I pick up like maybe two or three enemy bodies at some point within six sub levels. The last of which has tons. Yeah, and getting getting six Pokos with the bug bodies in this cave can happen like by accident. It's so easy. Yeah, oh, nice. So like this one, for instance. <laughs> yep, this spawn point is good. It's second best, I believe. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Or debatably, because we can get ones up here as well. <laughs> right. Again, another another avenue you're meant to really have yellows, but you can do something that looks sort of like that. Oh, okay. Or just oh, you do nailed that. it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, like that. so if that treasure was up there, I would have done a strategy, which is called Moke throwing, where you can sort of trick purple's momentum and get them up slopes. That was actually <laughs> harder than it looks. I must admit. I'm very glad I didn't have to do that, but could have. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that cookie again is a treasure that's. Too, too low poco count to be worth it um but yeah if if the bottle cap is up there it's worth 100 you have to get it and you have to do those monkey throws and some people definitely struggle with those they're not they're not easy no in fact it's me i struggle with those sometimes like <laughs> it's the <laughs> level of easy that like yeah absolutely i would not expect to get it every time so this is quite a tricky layout and it's in ways that might be quite hard to spot so I'll try and explain, but basically the way the spawn room has generated is with this xylophone. So you can see it in the middle here. The treasure can't go straight back to the pod because that xylophone's in the way. Oh, hold on. Oh, have you got bread bugged? I may have been bread bugged already. Yeah, I think I have. Oh, this is hard to tell now. I think he came out of that hole. I don't think it is. No. Okay, no. So, so for context, there should be another treasure here. I suspect then, yeah. It's in some weird... Oh. This, for context, this is a very strange layout. <laughs> Had me scared for a second. There's a chance on this floor that this treasure just does not spawn. It's very, very rare, but it yeah. can just not spawn. And it would have been, me worried. <laughs> it would have been perfect for a marathon. Oh, hello. Don't do that. There you go. Just preventing disasters one Pikmin at a time. Thankfully. Yeah. Oh, wait. Where's the exit? That's a fun question. Oh, it was through the other room. Right. Yeah. Either way, slightly stressful, but... <laughs> yeah, so you, you can get layouts on this floor sometimes where this little castanet is, like, it spawns right next to a bread bug. Bread bugs, if you're unaware, will just take a treasure and pull it into their little hole in the ground, and then you have to kill the bread bug in order to get the treasure back out. And killing the bread bug mm -hmm. takes 
ages. Yes, they do not receive damage like normal enemy types in this game. They only receive damage by, because they'll drag treasures along the ground and you have to take the treasure back to the pod and then basically smack the bread bug's head against the ceiling when it collects. And that does most of the damage. The other way of killing it is like throwing one Pikmin at a time and you have to land it straight on top. And it does maybe about an eighth of its health. Yeah, like an eighth or a tenth. Like killing one bread bug can easily take upwards of like 30 to 40 seconds. Yeah, easily. Okay, so ball bears here. This is actually quite a nice layout. I'm gonna try and lure him a little bit closer. So like this. Thankfully, we had all the time in the world to prepare for this guy, so he's really not very scary. It's a bit scary when he sinks up on you, but otherwise, like, fine. But we need to get his body, so this here is a very important collection. Because that's factored into our sort of Poco numbers that we've been discussing sort of the whole way through. This seems pretty, op like, pretty optimized, and I don't think I can really improve this much more. <laughs> Oh, do do it faster. <laughs> yeah, this is this is one of the few floors in the run where you sort of just like don't have enough Pikmin to carry everything that you need to carry. Yeah. So you kind of just have to do your best and hope it works out. Yeah, so like the white losses of thankfully of which I've had relatively few, you'll feel it a little bit more here cuz I could have about 7 more whites at this point, maybe a little more. So uh, they would of course speed up any treasures that they were put on and uh, the ball bear's body as well. But yeah, overall, good. That was a good layout. Again, uh, you can have one of those trick momentum throws called Moke throws for this floor that would be required. But And they're also quite slow because you have to set them up on this floor. So uh, I'm very glad I didn't have to do one of those. Otherwise, you have to really formula formulate your game plan around it. I think we're carrying on the trend of never having to do one of those throws in a marathon, which is quite funny. <laughs> <laughs> the people just are never, they're destined to never see it. But I promise it's pretty cool. This floor is extremely stressful. Um, it's the second to last floor in the run, so you can kind of just play it like completely like a lunatic. Like a lunatic. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's um, these cannon beetles on the side that will shoot boulders at you, and they're very hard to deload these things like once they're loaded. So you can lose a lot of Pikmin here very easily. We don't care for this category, but for a lot of other categories like all treasures and no major exploits where you do this, this cave not near the end of the run, uh, you have to be really careful, like really, really careful on this floor, and it makes it just insanely difficult. Yeah. So in general, I'm just trying to stay relatively out of trouble. Oh, they're going through there. Okay, right. So in order to prevent sort of deaths of this treasure going past those little dwarf ball bears, ball bulbs you can see? Oh, dwarf ball bears, sorry. Um, in order to prevent deaths on that, I'm going to have to uh, sort of deal with this, <laughs> even though I really want to get to the exit. Because I think, while, as Kemi said, the losses aren't too important, they can be quite a pain. Yeah, those dwarf dwarf bull bears, um, unlike most most like little bull orbs, like in that same sort of form factor, I guess, <laughs> they will just chase Pikmin forever. Like they won't return to a home point or something like that. Yeah. So they'll sort of just follow the treasures as they're moving, and you can build up like an army of them at the ship, just constantly eating like ten Pikmin at a time, yeah. and. You know, even though you're going into the last floor of the run, that can hurt bad. Exactly, because you still need like a good amount of Pikmin to function. And also they have a lot more health than regular sort of tiny form factor similar bulb bulb orbs. Yeah, okay. I think it's four or eight times as much health. It's a lot. Yeah, it's crazy. Okay, so killing these guys. So this floor has our friend, the giant red bug. Uh, he's not actually our friend. We hate giant red bug. Um, <laughs> he's cute though. He is very cute. But yeah. yes, he is an absolute pain in the butt because he steals treasures and acts somewhat randomly. And he dies in two hits, unlike uh, our little friends here. Uh, that's two hits, like bringing him to uh, to the ship, like carrying a treasure that he yeah. is carrying back to the ship. Uh, oh, one more purple on that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, wait, wait. Oh, I hope. Uh, nope. That's oh. very, very, very unfortunate. So the purples, instead of grabbing that red bug, which we really needed them to, they decided to grab the gate instead. So we're gonna have to do the bread bug kill of shame. This is what I was talking about before, which yeah. hopefully we don't get interrupted too much by cutscenes, but we will at some point or not. Okay, let's go, nice. Cool, yeah. Nice one. Yeah, so that's so, that's really unfortunate. It does happen sometimes, but you know, you can see how much ooh. time it loses. Oh, this didn't move. Bug. Interesting, okay. Ooh. So I think, make him go for this 
Oh, that's very annoying. So this is why we hate Giant Breadbug. He acts without reason and without care or consideration for others. Yeah. So this is the only boss in the entire run that we can't just like demolish instantly with purples. We do actually have to carry him back to the ship. Yeah. Um, and he does have a 100 Coco treasure that he's carrying. So, so we have to of, do it. Kind of mandatory to kill him. And he can just like completely take a hike sometimes, walk yeah. around out of bounds, uh, go for unreachable stuff like that. Like he's just a jerk. Yeah. So like here, even though there's lots of treasures that he could take, he is going this way instead. <laughs> yep, he is taking a hike. Oh, when he decides to word. go around here, he just has to go all the way around. Yeah, so we're going to be waiting here for a while, <laughs> which is quite annoying. I might I'll kill some more enemies to make sure that he's as likely as possible to actually try and get something. Yeah. But yeah, this is sort of why <laughs> you have to be very careful on that floor. So the reason this has happened... Oh, to... Oh god, I didn't realize I left him here. Okay, that's fine. So the reason this happened is because that purple didn't latch onto a treasure earlier, and it had sort of knock-on effects. So, uh, little mistakes like that, again, can absolutely destroy runs. Yeah, this this last floor is actually really tight. Like, you need to be you need to be killing a bunch of anod beetles, getting one treasure moving, killing an electric gate, um, making sure you don't get bread bugged on two other treasures, and then micromanaging giant bread bugs sort of all at the same time. And if you do it well, it's really smooth, and everything sort of just piles up at the ship. Yeah. Um, but you know, sometimes sometimes the game says no. But and... if one thing goes slightly awry, it can go quite badly. Yeah, like if you get delayed on any of those steps, it's. Yeah, it's rough. yeah, yeah. It can sort of spiral out of control a little bit. But as you can see, we've hit 10,000 Poco, so at the end of the day, it's been done. No absolute disasters. So uh, time will be coming up after we exit here. We land in Perplexing Pool, and then it will say, you have paid off the debt and fade to black. So that'll be when we call time. So not quite yet. So we do this just because in theory you could leave the cave and then need to grab something else, but yeah. So, I guess. Time. Cool, so uh, a few big mistakes, but otherwise, okay. <laughs> and we got to show off a relatively standard playthrough of Pikmin 2, I guess. A casual playthrough, of course. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. An as intended playthrough. <laughs> so, um, I guess for, I'll very quickly do chat outs on the presumption that's okay. Uh, Shout out to Pickhacker, Jayhawk, and now Kemi. They're sort of the three main people who have really, really dug into the technical side of this game. That's why we know as much as we do. Um, shout out to other top runners, uh, Ice Cube, Cap, Urban, Ghostly, TCB, Max, of course. Uh, and yeah, I think they're my main shout outs, unless anyone else wants to say a brief thing. Check out the Discord. It's where we all talk about Pikmin. <laughs> yes, we're we're a friendly lot. I'll put it that way. <laughs> oh yeah, we love getting new runners. Like, if you wanna if you wanna come learn just to, to speedrun this game, it's easy to get into, hard to master, and it's a ton of fun. So yeah, please it's come check it out. It's the easiest it's ever been to learn. So I guess we'll uh, leave on that and hopefully see some of you in the Discord. Fantastic! That was a lovely run there, uh, Jack. Uh, final time was 1 hour, 40 minutes, 37 seconds, if you're interested. I was. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to leave you guys with one last $5 donation from RRP8 with no comment, but thank you for the donation and for putting us at $34,400 exactly. So, uh, coming up next, we have Singles 2 with Gajik, uh, our very own Gajik. So, we're going to have a quick intermission, uh, another... Uh, a little bit of me telling you to buy ESA merch. And after that, with a few ads, we'll be right back with the next run. So thanks you everybody for that entertaining run. Uh, we'll be back shortly. <laughs> Thank you, ESA. <laughs> 